Hi guys, this is a short training uh, on using uh, Verilog for FPGA based design. So we'll be covering uh, in different blocks. First block, uh, in the first block, uh, I'll cover logic design. Uh, basically it won't be a full fledged logic design, but it will be a review of uh, what basic building blocks we use in the logic design process. Uh, we'll cover a couple of design examples to refresh your uh, ways of designing stuff and then we'll start Verilog. In Verilog we'll, uh, we'll cover basic building blocks, modules, gears, marks, demarks, registers and how data values are used and we'll do a coding example. Uh, this will be followed by, uh, by Verilog for simulation which is kind of different from Verilog for synthesis that, that, that's the first part. Uh, and in that part, we'll be writing test bench, and we'll be writing, uh, we'll be running simulations. Uh, and then we'll try to uh, synthesize the design that we we have uh, made. When when we are certain that this is working fine, then we'll actually port it on on an FPGA and test it. And uh, then there'll be another section on state machines. So this is the first presentation. So that that will be covering the first block that is logic design review. Okay. So uh, normally we used uh, this term register transfer level or RTL uh, in multiple meanings. Uh, one meaning is that when we say that we have an RTL level diagram of a design. Another thing is that when we say that uh, RTL is ready, then then normally we what we mean is that we have all written the Verilog code uh, or tested it. So uh, so Verilog or VHDL are uh, two popular languages. Will be will only be covering Verilog in this in this section. So what are the basic building blocks in logic design? Uh, basically. When we say we have a RTL level diagram available, uh, we mean a diagram that comprises of roughly uh, these components. It, and it can use gates, multiplexers, T multiplexers, uh, registers or memories, uh, and then address subtractors or multipliers. And we can have straight machines uh, or any combination of above. Uh, so what are gates? Uh, these are the common symbols used for the gates. If you remember correctly, this first one is called AND gate. AND gate outputs one if all of the inputs are one. If any of the input is zero, output will be zero. Uh, this is called OR gate. Uh, OR gate uh, outputs one if any of the input is one. So this is uh, that means if uh, any one input is one and rest of the inputs are zero, it will output one. If all of them are one, it will still output one. It will only output zero if all of the inputs are zero. So similarly, in the AND gate, uh, if a, uh, in AND gate, if any of the input is zero, output will be zero. Uh, this is called XOR gate. This is very similar to OR gate, but uh, normally XOR gate has two inputs and uh, it outputs one uh, if only one of them is one. So if one is one and the other is zero or other is one or this is zero, then output will, will be one. Uh, uh, but unlike uh, OR gate, if both inputs are one, uh, XOR gate will not output one. It, it, it only outputs one if exclusively only one input is one. This is symbol for NOT gate. Sometimes we'll use this symbol. Sometimes we only insert this circle that we normally call a bubble. We just uh, we insert a bubble and we uh, by, by that we mean uh, there is a NOT operation going on. Uh, there can be a bubble in front of AND, OR, or XOR. Uh, in that case, we call it NAND, NOR, or, uh, or XNOR. Uh, that means that uh, the output is uh, uh, passing through a NOT gate. Okay, next thing that we use is a register. A register can store bits. Normally it has n bit input and it has n bit output and it can store that input for one clock cycle. So clock is a, uh, is a generally uh, a tick that is going on. Uh, it's a basically uh, oscillating signal that is one and zero, one and zero, one and zero. So uh, we normally work on rising edge of a clock or a falling edge of a clock by rising edge, we mean that when the transition is from zero to one, 
or by falling edge what we mean that uh, if the transition is from 1 to 0 most of the circuits work on rising edge of the clock but at times we use falling of the edge of the clock as well so let me explain with the diagram uh, normally there is also a reset signal which uh, sets its initial value to to a known state normally it's zero so uh, what we do is that uh, clock clock is a signal that is going on 101010 so this is called a timing diagram uh, from left to right time uh, is increasing so clock is one for a while then it is zero then it is one then it will be zero then it is one so let's say we have uh, at the input value three so by this these two lines and three we mean that at these end bits uh, the binary value of three is input so for example if if, if it is um, seven down to zero that is eight bits so then uh, the value will be zero 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 one one so uh, so if, the, uh, if there is three at the input and if this is working on the rising edge of a clock, then when this rising edge of a clock comes, the output will be three. So before that, we don't know the output because we don't know what was the input at the uh, previous value. So we are uh, showing it by X. By X, we generally mean we don't care what, what was the value before that. We have, we have started looking at the values uh, from this rising edge of a clock. So if in the next cycle I input a value of 4, then at that rising edge of a clock, since input is 4, the output will be 4. Similarly, in, in the next input, uh, next cycle, if the input is 5, so at this rising edge of a clock, input is 5, so in the subsequent cycle, output will be 5. So this is the common working of a register that it stores the value at input for the next clock cycle. If the value at input was three, it, it will be stored. If it was four, then four will be stored for one complete cycle. In between, if the value changes, it doesn't matter. But before uh, a small amount of time that we can call setup time before that clock edge, then the value has to be stable and that value will be stored in the uh, in the register. We often call it that that value is latched in that register. Okay. Uh, Similarly, uh, very often we use another signal called enable with the register. So what enable does is that uh, that if this register will work only when this enable signal uh, is one. So for example, uh, if we say that uh, at this clock edge we have uh, this enable signal to be one, so that means that before uh, before this clock edge uh, in the rest of clock edges. Uh, we didn't have this enable signal one so that means that uh, the value won't be stored in the register so register will retain its old value whatever it was so only at the clock edge when enable is one uh, the value will be stored so this gives this register capability to uh, store values indefinitely so for example if we stored a value here it, it might be a result of any computation and we might need it uh, maybe uh, three four seconds uh, uh, later so that means that that could potentially mean millions or billions of clock cycles uh, afterwards uh, because this clock is generally very very fast uh, on fpgas we are generally talking about 100 mega cycles per second uh, and on on uh, a6 it can uh, go to in giga uh, cycles per second so so a few seconds is a large amount of time from uh, uh, from digital design perspective so if we need uh, this value after a couple of seconds then we need to store it for uh, uh, for a while so if we don't uh, assert enable uh, for that uh, for that while this file file will be stored in this register okay so next uh, component is a multiplexer a multiplexer uh, works this way that uh, we have multiple inputs and and, and a select line for example, if there are four inputs, then this select line will be uh, two bits. So what it does is it selects the input to be forwarded at the output. For, for example, if the input is zero, uh, this will be connected to output. If input is one, this will be connected to the output. So and so on. Uh, so it can be uh, three inputs, four inputs, whatever we want. So this is working of a mux. Sometimes we call it a select line. Sometimes we also call it an address. 
the opposite component of mux is called a dmux. Dmux works this way that uh, based on select line, if select line is zero, we connect this input to this output and connect rest of the outputs to zero. If select line is one, we connect it to the next in, uh, next output. If it's two, we connect it to next output and so on. So, uh, so this is called demultiplexer or dmux uh, in short. Uh, so uh, these are the more uh, commonly used components. There are more to follow, but uh, I'll do a small example here. For example, a very common component used in digital circuits is called register file. Register file means that we have a set of registers on which we want to store some value. So for example, uh, I I have some some registers. Uh, let's let's assume these are eight or sixteen registers. So uh, what we do is we have a single data out uh, and what we want to do is we take as an address as an input for example if address is zero we want that this register should be connected to output if, uh, if it is one then we want this register to be connected to the output uh, if it's two we want this register to be connected and so on so what do you think will be the component that we should use here pause the video for a moment and then uh, resume it when you come up with the answer so if you um, if you have thought it through, then it should be a mux that should uh, uh, that that will do the job. So if address is zero, this register will be forwarded. If address is one, uh, this register will be forwarded, and so on. Similarly, in a register file, we want uh, to write on the registers as well. So what we want is that whenever at a rising edge of a clock, this write signal is asserted. Uh, then we want to write on any of the register. And what we want to write, uh, we give it as an input, uh, we call it data in. So, uh, so if the address is zero, we want this data to be written on register number zero. If the, uh, if the address is one, we want to write this data to register number one, and so on uh, until the rest of the registers. So uh, pause the video uh, and then think about it. What could be the circuit to do the job? So I'll resume it later. Okay, so if you have think about, uh, thought about it, then uh, the best approach to do is to broadcast the data to all registers and to demux the write signal to all the registers as an enable signal. So what it means is that uh, if we want to write 10 at location number three, so I'll input 10 at all the registers, but uh, since the write signal is used as an enable so only enable of register number three will be asserted and enables of rest of the registers won't be asserted so since the uh, enable won't be asserted uh, so those registers won't be written so it doesn't matter if uh, they get the wrong data because it won't be written anyway so uh, so this is a common mistake maybe if you thought about it if you used uh, only one dmux at times people use dmux on the data line so this is a very common mistake that we made and that was the whole purpose of this design example okay so this register file also gives um, a conceptual model of a memory as well so when we talk about memories in on fpgas so the, uh, what we mean is that we want to give an address and a write signal and a data in signal and we want to write to that uh, to that address it's slightly different and then reg file it generally has a delay of one clock cycle but it gives a good conceptual model uh, and normally it's not uh, memory is not implemented as a reg file it's generally implemented differently but conceptually you can think of it as a uh, as a small memory and a, on a larger memories that that we generally call block rams on fpga behave similarly only with one difference that we have uh, one cycle delay uh, in the output okay in addition to uh, to multiplex uh, demultiplexes, we also can use adders, subtractors uh, in our design. So uh, generally, if we have n inputs, then the output is generally one bit higher than that because uh, if we add two maximum numbers in n bits, we'll we'll get a number that is uh, that cannot be stored in n bits. It has to be stored in n plus one bits. Many a times we can ignore that if we know that our output will be within range then in that case, we can have output of n bits as well. Uh, normally, adder subtractor can be designed uh, combined as well, so, so that we have a, a control signal that asserts. Uh, uh, when asserted, it can subtract. If it is deasserted, uh, we can uh, subtract it. 
Uh, additionally, we can have uh, option to saturate output as well. So if we have, uh, if we don't have uh, n plus one bits, we only have n bits. So we can have an extra logic, uh, some extra logic to make sure that if output is going out of the way, then we cap it to the maximum value instead of uh, having a random number at the output. Similarly, multiplier multiplies two numbers, and normally, if we multiply two n bit numbers, uh, the output can be of two n bits. So again, there are options to have signed and unsigned multipliers, and again, we have option to saturate it. Um, so these are the, the, uh, the generally building blocks that we use. Uh, so so <coughs> uh, so now we uh, do a couple of examples. Uh, we first start with a simple example, which is a simple decrementer capable of counting numbers. Uh, on, on clock cycles, uh, you can imagine it uh, like a traffic signal. So on a traffic signal, we, we have a down counter that uh, keeps uh, counting down till we reach uh, zero. So we want to make that kind of a uh, decrementer and then we'll cover another uh, a little bit complex example uh, that is a 4D FIPO. So what is a decrementer? First of all, when we want to design something, we make a black box and we write all the inputs and outputs. And then we think of it, what can be done uh, about it and how can we design it? So now, uh, since you already know all the building blocks, we'll be using only those building blocks to uh, try to make this uh, decrementer. So uh, what we want to do is that uh, we want to have uh, a value of count and we want to have a load signal that if I assert load for, for a clock cycle on the, that rising edge of the clock, I want to save the value, uh, uh, save an initial value in the counter. So let's say I assert load and I save the value 100 in the counter. And then I want to, uh, whenever I want to decrement it, I, I, I want to assert the decrement signal. For example, uh, if it's a traffic light, then I can uh, load a value of, let's say if it waits for 60 seconds, I can load initial value of 60. So I'll assert load. Uh, and at the same time, apply a 60 at initial value. So that will be loaded in the counter. So we'll have output 60 at that moment. Then after every second, I can assert decrement for one cycle. And on that rising edge of clock, it will be decremented by one. Uh, so it will be uh, 59 in the next second and so on uh, until it gets to zero. And that, that value we can uh, see at the count. So what do you think we can, uh, can be done? Uh, you can pause the video and think about it. Uh, I will. I can give you a hint first. Uh, that uh, normally, how I design these circuits, I just first put whatever thing is necessary to be uh, without which we cannot design the circuit. So when I put it there, uh, then I think of it that what can be added next and what can be added next, and that that way I just draw it. So pause the video and think about it. Okay, so so uh, this is how I would design it. So first of all, I I need something to store the values. So I definitely need a register in there. So that that's the first thing. Next thing, when I think about it, I need to store this initial value in this register. So so that is one thing I just, that need to be stored in it. But it's not only this initial value. I also want to store the decremented value. The decremented value will be from the same register and it will be decremented. So this minus minus uh, means that I want to decrement it by one. Uh, so since there are two values that I want to store uh, in this register, but register is only one input. So if there are multiple options and we want to select between them, we generally use a max. So I'll, I'll add a max here. So that will select whether I want to uh, store the initial value or whether I want to store the decremented value. So when we add a max, so this max is selecting between two uh, things. So it has a select line. So what will be the select line? So, uh, so pause the video and think about it again. Okay. So about the select line, what we can do is we can simply tie it to decrement. So if the decrement is one, I can uh, take this input, and if decrement is zero, then I can load the initial value. But it will it won't work fine because let's say uh, uh, on one second boundary I decremented it, but as soon as the decrement signal is low, it will 
uh, write down the initial value gain. So we decremented it from 60 to 59 for a cycle. But in the next cycle, since the decrement will be zero, uh, initial value will, will be loaded again that we don't want. So what we can do is we, can, we have to control when we want to write on this register. Uh, so we have to do, uh, do two things. First is to select things, but also we have to control when we want to write on this register. We don't want to write on this register on every cycle. So if we don't want to uh, write on a register on every cycle, that means that register needs an enable signal. So we have to have an enable. And if we do it correctly, what we can do is we only want to enable this register if there is a decrement signal or a load signal. So so as I am saying it, that we only want to enable it if there is a decrement signal or there is a load signal. So that or in the statement also gives you a hint that we can use an or gate. So if we do that, then if there is a load signal or a decrement signal, this enable will be uh, asserted. And since, uh, so if the decrement, if, if this was asserted due to decrement, this side will be uh, connected. If it was uh, in, uh, it was selected due to load signal, then decrement will be zero at the time and this value will be selected. Uh, there is a chance to have a decrement and a load on the same clock cycle, so we haven't handled it in this case in this uh, specific design. But what we can do is we can use an XOR gate as uh, for that case, and in that case, if there is a load and a decrement at the same time, we won't enable the circuit, so the value will remain whatever it is. But it depends how we want to actually uh, what circuit we are using it in. Maybe in, uh, we want to prioritize decrement over load. Maybe we want to prioritize uh, load over decrement. If we want to prioritize load over decrement, then instead of decrement, we want uh, we will want to connect load signal to the mux. And then if that is one, we'll uh, write this side, and otherwise we'll write this. Okay. So now let's do another example. So by now. Uh, uh, you, your mu uh, brain muscles might have flexed a little bit, so let's let's do another example and flex them a little bit more. So we want to make a 4D FIFO. So what is so what is a FIFO? FIFO uh, takes uh, uh, so FIFO is a common term in computer science. We have push and pop signals. When there is a push signal, we want to uh, store this data in this FIFO. And when there is a pop signal, we want to bring out the, the data that was stored first in, in the FIFO. FIFO stands for first in, first out. So whatever value was written first, it will be output first. So, uh, so what we want is, for example, we want to store 100 in, uh, in, the, in the FIFO, so I'll assert a push signal and push at 100 here, that will be stored in the FIFO, then I want to uh, uh, store 500, I'll, I'll push uh, again and uh, give a value of 500, so FIFO will have two values, 100 and 500. So uh, if I want to pop it, so the, la uh, the first value that was uh, written was 100, so add that out, always it should be the value that was written first. So if I pop it, that means that I have read that value and now I can read the next value. So if I assert pop signal, that means that that 100 is already read out. So in the next cycle, the value that should be output should be 500 and so on. So by 4D, we mean that uh, we can at max store four values uh, in the FIFO. So if there are four pushes and there is no pop, that means that we, uh, we can't push anymore. Uh, and since this is a simple design, we don't handle that case, but we would say that whoever is pushing has to make sure that he doesn't push if, if the FIFO is full. So we, we assert FIFO full signal if we have four consecutive pushes without pop. But if there is a pop, then that means there are three values stored, then we can push again uh, and so on. If there is uh, if the FIFO is empty, then there should be it shouldn't be any pop uh, on the FIFO because there is no data available. So if there is a FIFO empty asserted, uh, which will be at the start, and whenever uh, we have popped out all values, then uh, then then pop should not be asserted. So think about it. What could be the design options? Yeah, pause for a moment and think about. It. Okay. So uh, again, when I think about it we need at least four registers to store the values. There can be multiple design options, but one way to design is that I always push this way. So I connect data in with first register uh, and the data out of first register to data in a second and so on, till the four registers are there. 
So whenever I push a data, that data will be written on this register. The data that was written in this register will be moved to the next and the next and next and the data uh, written in the last register will be lost. Since at the start, we don't need any data. So what we initialize them with zeros and uh, uh, this value can be overwritten. We don't care about it because there was no data in the FIFO. But if four pushes have been done, then, la uh, then first value will be here, second will be here, third will be here, fourth will be here. So uh, to write it, uh, right side is pretty simple. Uh, we just need to write everything whenever there is a push. So we can, do we need an enable signal here? Think about it. Yes, we do, because we only want to push when there is a push signal. So uh, so we can push, we can use push as an enable signal of the uh, of this register. Okay, so this, uh, this right side was simple. How can we read from it? Uh, so for example, uh, uh, for example, if uh, I have written three values, one is stored here, one is there, one is there. So the first value will be here. But if I had I had written only two values, that value would have been here. If I had only pushed one value, that would have been here. So that means I need to be able to read from here, 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 and here. So I have to uh, read from four different uh, locations. So that means uh, I need to connect this data out with uh, with any one of them depending on how many times I have pushed the data. So when we have multiple inputs and we want to connect it to one output, what do we use? That's right, we use a max. So uh, so we, um, we use a max that can select between four inputs. So that means it will be two select lines because with two bits, we can have values 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, that is 0, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, but how can we select this? Select line, how do we know that whether we want to read from here, here, or here, or here? It depends on how many times we have pushed it. And it also depends on whether we popped some data or not. For example, I, if I had pushed four times, then data will be here. So I should have uh, one, zero, one, two, three. So I, 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 would, I would want this to be at the output. But if there is uh, there has been a pop, in between then that value will be here so we want some kind of counter here that can count pushes as well as pops but we want to increment on push and we want to decrement on pop uh, so that counter can also give us signals that if it is four then five is full and if it is zero then five is empty uh, so that that's that's kind of the design that rdl level design that we are looking into so but we haven't designed this counter yet so uh, rest of the logic is pretty much designed. This is a comparator. These are registers and muxes. So uh, how how about this counter? So uh, so we want to board a counter. You have already made a counter, the decrementary example in the decrementary example. So in this example, we don't want to load an initial value. We want, we want to start at zero. And whenever there is an increment, we want to increment it. And whenever there is a decrement, we want to decrement it. Again, we need a register that holds the count value. And we want to decrement as well as increment it. So we need a decrementer as well as an incrementer. And since we have, we want to store one of those values, so we also need a max, just like in the previous example. And again, uh, the select line can be increment, and we have we can have an enable that only if there is an increment or decrement, then we we can uh, enable this register. So if the increment is one, so this value would be written. If decrement is one, this value is written. If both are zero, then by default, decremented value will be selected because if select line is zero, but it won't be written because uh, because if both inputs are zero, enable will be deselected. So now we have designed the counter as well. So so again, uh, what I want to show with these examples is that uh, that until we have this level of design diagram available. We don't write viral of course. We have to reach the state un uh, unless we have this design diagram. If we don't do that, uh, we'll make mistakes and we'll be writing in a software style and that doesn't work in hardware. Uh, so you have to uh, come out of this mentality of writing software because uh, Verilog is a language, but it's a hardware description language. Uh, whatever we write describes hardware. So I have seen codes where people uh, have uh, written spaghetti code that doesn't uh, that runs in simulation but doesn't run on FPGA because they haven't gone through the design pro uh, design process correctly. Okay, 
So, uh, in addition to uh, the components that we design, there uh, there also exists a library of components, common components that that are uh, used. Uh, uh, we generally call them IP cores. For example, FIR filter. If we are using as uh, we doing a signal processing example, FFT core, also for signal processing, error correction codes for. Uh, if we are working on communication systems, similarly, there are image processing libraries available as well. So there's a, there's a lot of components that are available uh, uh, in open source domain as well as uh, in form of IP cores that are ready to use, that are blocks that you, you only need to study the document, how they work, and then interface with those uh, things. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop here and uh, in the next uh, section uh, cover uh, how to write very long code.